Hi, I'm Jay Ashcroft, Missouri Secretary of State, and I want to welcome you to the Missouri State Archives. Here at the Missouri State Archives, we keep a record. It's the repository of all the historical important acts of our state government. Although the archives wasn't created until 1965, the Secretary of State has been the recorder of that state information since 1820. And we have delightful tidbits of history going all the way back and beyond our state flag, which was approved in 1913. The silk flag was designed by Marie Elizabeth Oliver, and the great seal in the center was hand-painted on the fabric. 24 stars symbolizing Missouri's place as the 24th state surround the great seal. In 1988, Missouri fourth graders sent in their change in a penny campaign to help repair tears in the silk and damage to the painted great seal. After treatment, the flag was put on display so students visiting the archives in the future would always be able to view Missouri's original state flag. Hello, welcome to the Missouri State Archives. This is the reading room. If you were to walk in here and take a look around, you would see tables, chairs, books. It would look a lot like a library. We're a little bit different than a library in that we don't loan materials out here at the archives. You can come and look at them, but we do not loan them out because a lot of times the records that we have are the only copy that exists. We keep records of permanent and open value here at the Missouri State Archives. Um, we get them from the three branches of state government here in Missouri, which are the executive, legislative, and judicial branches. And we don't, do not get federal records, they're only Missouri's records. Um, we do accept records that have a permanent value, and what we mean when we say permanent here at the archives is that we want to keep them forever. We want to provide access, and we want to keep them as long as we can. We do several things here at the archives that you'll learn about on this tour to ensure that that happens. And we also call them open records because they're records that we want to make available to the public and anyone that walks through the doors. You don't have to be a Missouri citizen. You don't have to be a U.S. citizen. You can be from anywhere in the world, come into the Missouri State Archives and access the records. So we use that word access a lot here at the archives. Uh, much like a library provides access to books, we want to provide access to the records. We do this in several ways. You can come into the archives and ask that we pull a record and we'll do our best to go locate it, pull it out here and let you view it. Um, we also are big believers in digitization here at the Missouri State Archives. One of the big reasons we do that is that you can provide access to the public by digitizing records. And this, does, this, this helps the public, it helps staff members, and it helps the records here at the archives. We don't have to pull them very often if we provide access online. There are a couple examples of this. For example, we do digitize and provide access to Missouri death certificates. Those cover 1910 to 1969. And the way that works is that Missouri law requires that they be 50 years old before we can put them online. So each first working day in January, we get a new batch of records. We organize them with the help of volunteers, digitize them, and then index them and provide access online. I mentioned we get several different types of researchers in the archives. We get genealogy research, which is family research. We get legal researchers. We get historical researchers. We get professors, students, teachers. You name it, we get those types of researchers here at the archives. The vast majority of which are the genealogy history researchers. They come in here because they want to trace back their lineage here in Missouri. And as you might know, Missouri became a state in 1821 and the history of Missouri goes back far before that. If you look behind me, there is a conservation lab through the glass windows that you will see. That's one of the first steps to digitization and making that, getting access to the records. Records go back there to have blemishes removed, such as tape, glue, some of the things that people put on records that cause permanent damage. And after they go to the conservation lab and get any kind of cleanup that can be done, they then go to the imaging lab. And this is where the physical records go to be scanned and then digitized and placed on a CD, a disc, placed online from there. Um, let me talk about some of the different formats which makes digitization a little bit difficult. Um, as you know, there's been several different formats that records have gone through in just a short amount of time. Right now, we use USB drives. A lot of you probably have seen them before and know a lot about them. These allow you to put records on them, plug them into a computer, and then view that record. What you might not be familiar with or less familiar with is an eight track tape. Some of you might be a, a little too young to know what this is, but this was another way that records were digitized and you could view them or listen to them, listen to audio and view physical records. And then you have floppy disk. 
Um, floppy disk, there aren't too many computers left that view floppy disk. It's kind of gone to the USB drives. This just gives you an example of some of the records that go, get outdated or some of the formats that get outdated and make record digitization very difficult. So we also have microfilm here at the Missouri State Archives. We have about 66,000 reels on microfilm for county level stuff. And we also have about five or 6,000 more reels for census records, military records, and some federal film. Um, we use microfilm here at the archives because of its durability. Um, as you can see, when I wrinkle this up, it comes back to normal. If I did that to a page on a record, it would destroy it. Um, it also has a very long shelf life. We, scientists estimate that it lasts about 500 years. We don't know that for sure yet, but that's the estimate. We have a couple different sizes. We have this 35 millimeter and then this 16 millimeter microfilm, both of which can hold a, a lot of pages on them. It's believed they can hold about 2,500 pages on this 35 millimeter microfilm. This is typically used for your larger pages like this Missouri State Penitentiary book. And then we use the smaller microfilm for letter size pages and smaller pages. So this takes up far less space. It's extremely durable, lasts a long time. And another important aspect to it is all you need is magnification and light to see what's on these pages. As you can see, you can't see them right now. But if you were to hold them up to light and magnify them, you could read the records just like you would if they were sitting in front of you on a piece of paper. We've also got CDs here at the archives, and when you come into the archives and you ask to see a record, we may give you a disc and put that into a computer for you to view it. It's one of the most common things we use it for are images. We do have a lot of image collections that go on CD and make access to those images very easy. So after talking about some of the challenges of access and some of the different formats and how they've changed over the years, um, let's talk a little bit about what kind of records we get here at the archives. So I mentioned we get executive, legislative, and judicial. Um, if you were to come into the archives, into the reference room, you might ask a question such as, who is the current governor here in Missouri? A lot of you might know that it is Governor Michael Parson. You'll see an image of him here in this book. This is the kind of question that we would refer you to this book, which we call the Official Manual of the State of Missouri, or aptly named the Blue Book. It gets its name from the fact that it's blue. Nearly every one that's released every two years is blue, and we call it the Official Manual. We would refer people with simple reference questions such as that this, to this book. Now, what if I were to ask you who was governor in 1913? That might be a little bit more difficult to answer, but again, we would refer the patron to this blue book. You would see that it's Elliot Majors here in the photo. This does provide some biographical information about him, as well as people in his cabinet. It would provide a little bit of information about them. So it's a gold mine for genealogy researchers who might be related to him or know someone related to him and doing research. Another interesting thing about this blue book is you have these architectural drawings of the Missouri State Capitol. As you might know, the Missouri State Capitol burned down in 1911 after it was struck by lightning. And this is just new architectural drawings of what would have been approved for the new Capitol building, which would have gone through the legislature, been approved, voted on, and then they give the public access to the plans of the new Capitol. I also mentioned legislative research here at the, here at the library. Um, we have a lot of bills, and you can track the progress of various bills throughout their lifespan, and you can track the changes over time here at the archives. A lot of legislative researchers are doing just that. They want to look through old session laws and see what a bill looked like when it passed versus what it looked like maybe 50 years later and how it changed over time. I will show an example of this bill here. This is a bill that would have made the Missouri State flag the official Missouri State flag. Um, it gives you a lot of the legal language here, and this would have been passed in 1913 and we actually house the original here at the archives. We also have judicial records here at the archives. We have Supreme Court records. Um, we have appellate court records for the Eastern, Western, and Southern districts. And we have those up till relatively recently, and then as far back as those records will go. I'll show you an example of an old Supreme Court record here. So when we organize the records, we put them into files. And we usually give a physical description of what's in there, just a brief case synopsis and kind of summarize the contents of the case. This is a Supreme Court case file. And interestingly enough, this is from 1868. So that'll show you its age a little bit. 
Some people are shocked to see some of the original script that is written on the pages. Obviously now a lot of the records are typed when you get the court records now, but this is what they would have looked like in 1868. All right, since we've talked about the three types of records, the executive, legislative, and judicial branch, let's talk a little bit about what we do digitize and put online. And we do have Missouri State Penitentiary records. I do have one open here on the table to give you an idea of the physical size of it and then some of the information that's in it. These penitentiary books, these register books, are a listing of inmates who entered the prison and then the date that they entered, the date they were discharged, why they were there, their name, a physical description, and all sorts of that information. These started in 1836, and we have them up through about the 1980s here at the archives. You'll see that there's a guy over here named William Boggs. He's the second line down, and he was actually in prison for impersonating a voter. We kind of flipped to this one because it's a little bit of an interesting reason to be in the prison in the first place. Um, Missouri State Penitentiary was not a good place to go and he got sent there for impersonating a voter. Okay, let's also talk about a couple other things. Death certificates, I mentioned them earlier on in the talk. Um, death certificates are online from 1910 to 1969 and you can access them at your convenience at home and print them off. They are open records. They're probably the most popular record we have digitized because people use a lot of it for their genealogy research. They can find their relatives, print it off, find their cause of death, and find family members listed on the certificate as well. <laughs> and this is William Blind Boone, who was blind from an early childhood after he developed a brain fever and went blind as a result of a surgery that was done to relieve the swelling on his brain. He became a relatively famous musician and perform, performed thousands of concerts here in the United States and around the world. So that's an example of what you can find. You'll also find Laura Ingalls Wilder in there as well. And lastly, we got census records here at the archives. Now these are federal records and we do have state censuses as well and we've actually put those online, some, state, some of the state censuses online through our new census database. This is actually a census record showing Butch O'Hare and at the time of this he was only five years old you might know him, he was the first naval recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor in World War II. He actually shot down five enemy fighters single-handedly by himself when his naval carrier was attacked. And he's also the namesake of the Chicago O'Hare International Airport. So that'll just give you an idea of some of the different types of records we have. Again, digitization is key. We're trying to get things out there to provide access. And it keeps hands off the records a little bit and you can still view the records. Um, thank you for stopping by on this visit here at the Reference Room, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Hi, my name's Mary, and this is the Stacks portion of today's tour. Now, behind me is the Stacks. That's where the Missouri State Archives holds all of its permanent and historic records. You heard from Daniel that the Missouri State Archives is an open archive, which means anybody can come and view any of our records, but we are a closed stack which means next time you come to the archives to do some research, you'll wait out in the reference room, you'll tell a reference archivist what it is you're looking for, then that archivist will come back here, take the record off the shelf, and bring it out to you. We do this because we have over 300 million pieces of paper behind this door, so really we are worried that a record will accidentally get into the wrong folder, or the wrong folder in the wrong box, or on the wrong spot of the shelf, and then we're gonna have a really hard time trying to find that record again. So that's what a closed stack means. And again, because we're closed, you will notice the door is locked. You have to have a special badge or pass card to get in. In addition, the door is also an alarmed. So if the door is open at the wrong time of day or open for too long, Capitol Police will be notified and they'll come down to see what's going on. So come with me and we will go into the stacks and see where all of our permanent and historic records are stored. All right, this is the stacks. This is where the Missouri State Archives stores all of its permanent and historic records. If you'll notice the floor, the ceiling, the walls are all made out of concrete. And the big moving bookcases, the stacks themselves, they're all made out of metal. So what natural disaster are we afraid of? Fire. 
If records get dirty, they can be cleaned. If they get torn, they can be mended. If they get wet, they can be dried. But if a record burns, it is just a small pile of ashes and there's nothing we can do with it after that. Now, in 1911, there was no Missouri State Archives and all of the state government records were stored in the basement of the Capitol building when the Capitol building was struck by lightning and burned to the ground. This is a photograph of the Capitol that night showing it on fire. We also have a photograph taken later showing the ruin of the Senate chamber. So after that 1911 Capitol fire, the state decided to store all of its records in different places. So rather than putting all of its eggs in one basket, some records would be over here in this building, some records would be over there in that building. It sounded like a good idea, but it ended up with records being stored like this. These are land records being stored on the floor of a basement garage of a coal burning powerhouse. That is not how you ever want to store your records. The man climbing there, that is State Representative Alexander Petrovic. In 1965, he sponsored legislation that created the Missouri State Archives. We were created to be a central state agency that would care for and store and protect Missouri's permanent and historic records. All right, as you can see, we store all of our records in archival folders, in archival boxes. Now, a lot of times people ask, how do you find, actually find a record? Well, archivists make things called finding aids. And a finding aid is a lot like a table of contents in a book. So your table of contents is gonna tell you that chapter three starts on a certain page. And the finding aid is gonna tell you that the record you're looking for is in folder one of box 18 of 6A, tier one, shelf six. So that way the archivist comes right to the right location. They find the box they're looking for. You can tell because it's labeled. And then when you open the box up, you'll see that all of the folders are labeled and all of the folders are numbered. So that way it's easy for a patron to find the record they're looking for. Uh, these folders and boxes are a special quality. They're acid free. They are water resistant. And we're also lucky that we get to have movable shelving. So um, the shelves themselves, the bookcases will move. When two bookcases meet, they are gonna form a bit of a seal. So if our sprinkler system does go off, water won't get in there. We keep the stacks at a very stable, cool temperature. When you're storing records, you will really wanna keep them at a stable temperature and stable humidity. You don't want big fluctuating swings in temperature. So you don't wanna store a record in an attic where it's gonna get real hot during the summer and real cold during the winter. You wanna keep everything level. All right, now for everyone's favorite part of the tour, I'm gonna to show you how the movable shelving works. Um, if we wanted to get into a record on the back side of this bookcase, we're going to have to move it. But first, we're gonna to have to look down the aisle and make sure we're not about to squish a coworker. So, all right. Now, fully loaded, each of these bookcases weighs two tons. And with these handles, we're able to move them with just one hand. And if you notice, not every bookcase has a handle. Uh, number seven behind me is stationary. We have 25 of these bookcases in a row, and keeping certain ones of them stationary means you don't have to try and move all 25 at a time. The most you ever have to move is five at a time. Welcome to Famous Missourians. This is where we will be looking at historical documents documenting famous people in the history of Missouri. And we will be looking at facsimiles, which just means really, really good copies. So think about some of the famous Missourians that you may have learned about in school, such as Daniel Boone or George Washington Carver or Harry Truman or Laura Ingalls Wilder. We'll be talking about those and many, many more. So first up is a man named Daniel Boone. So he was one of the pioneers of Missouri 
Missouri and an early settler. So this is an 1804 land grant record for Daniel Boone and his son Nathan. Daniel Boone was an early settler of Missouri and a pioneer of the area. Boone County, Boonesville, Boones Lick are all named after him. Um, so like I said, this is a land grant record. You can see a nice little map of the property here. This is essentially like an 1804 version of a mortgage or a lease saying, hey, I am allowed to be right here. Um, this document is also in two different languages. It is in an English and in Spanish. That is because before the Missouri was a part of the United States. We were a part of Spanish territory and we were also part of a French territory. Um, like I said, this is from 1804. Missouri did not become a state until 1821. So we have documents about Missouri before Missouri was even a state. Our oldest document at the Missouri State Archives is from 1770. So we have records from before Missouri was even a state and the United States was even a country, which is pretty cool. So next up, we're gonna be talking about this man. His name is Dred Scott. He's a pretty important character in St. Louis history and Missouri history. Um, so he was an enslaved man in St. Louis in the 1840s. He and his wife Harriet uh, were taken to the free state of Illinois and the free territory of Wisconsin by their enslaver. And when they got back to Missouri, they decided to sue for their freedom. In St. Louis, there are a lot of freedom suits like this where enslaved people were taken to free territories and decided to sue for their freedom. Uh, it was got appealed and went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court and the United States Supreme Court decided that no other enslaved people were able to sue for their freedom and Dred and Harriet's court case was a really big catalyst or jumping off point for the start of the Civil War. So they're important people to know. This is one of those documents from that circuit court case in St. Louis. Uh, you'll notice that the lawyer who wrote this had very, very messy handwriting, but at the bottom, uh, he wrote Dred Scott, his mark, and then Dred Scott wrote an X to say that he had signed the document. Why did he write an X as opposed to signing his own name? Well, it was illegal for enslaved people and for free people of color in Missouri at the time to know how to read or write. So that X was basically designating that he had the document read to him, he understood it, and he was signing the terms and conditions, but he had to write an X instead of signing his name. Fast forward a few years and we have the ordinance abolishing slavery in the state of Missouri. Uh, so abolish essentially means to get rid of or to end. And this was in January of 1865, a few months before the 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution was ratified. So you'll notice that along the side here, it looks a little wonky. Um, that is because this was one of the documents in the 1911 Capitol fire. So it was actually folded up in a box like this. The top of the box got singed, but then we still have the core of the document, which is pretty cool. Also, if you have ever done your homework and you have forgotten a word and you had to carry it in real small, uh, don't mind because adults do that too. If you noticed, the writer of this document actually forgot the word slaves on one of this last line, so they had to carry it in real small too. Shifting gears just a little bit, uh, we're gonna be talking about census records now. This is 2020, we just had a census completed, but they, the United States government takes a census every 10 years, essentially to take attendance of everybody living in the entire country. This is to uh, determine how many representatives you get in Congress, determines funding for all sorts of things. Um, so this is the 1870 census in Newton County. On line 15, there is a 10 year old boy named George Carver. George Carver would then grow up to be George Washington Washington Carver, and he was a noted peanut scientist, and he did lots of work with soybeans and crop rotation. He did lots of good work at the Tuskegee Institute uh, down in Alabama, but he was born in Missouri and then lived in the southwest part of the state for his childhood. This is another example of a census record. This is a census index card. This is for an 18-year-old young man living with his brother Herbert in Kansas City. His name was Walter E. Disney. Yes, Walt Disney uh, grew up in Missouri after moving here from Chicago as a toddler. Uh, this is right before he would have moved out to California to really start his animation career. He started his animation career in Kansas City, uh, living with his brother. So Walt Disney, our very own. Speaking of Walt Disney, we also have in our collection this Missouri Nature Nights pledge card. So this was drawn for kids in Missouri in this program, and it was a program for the Department of Conservation for kids to promise to keep animals safe and keep nature clean and all that good stuff that we should still be doing. Um, but this is 
a card drawn by Disney and we know about when it was drawn because if you notice the deer look quite a bit like Bambi and the rabbits look quite a bit like Thumper, the birds look like they belong in Snow White. So we know that this card was drawn in the late 30s, early 40s just because of the animation style. So kids in Missouri got their very own Walt Disney drawing which is pretty cool. Another large part of our collection are death certificates, as was mentioned earlier. So we have death certificates for author Laura Ingalls Wilder and her husband, Almanzo. If you've read Little House on the Prairie, Almanzo was farmer boy. Uh, little Laura Ingalls Wilder spent most of her adult life in the southern portion of the state. Uh, you can still visit her home. But death certificates are really, really cool, especially if you are starting off as um, doing a genealogy project because they have lots of good information on one piece of paper. They have the parents' names, the spouses' names, their occupation, where they're buried, their birth date, where they were born, all kinds of really cool information on one nice piece of paper. So if you're starting off on a family tree project, this is a really good place to start. Missouri has ours on our website, so you can feel free to search those as well. In addition to documents, which I'm showing a lot of textual documents, we also have over 700,000 photographs in our collection. This is one of our favorites. Here we have Harry Truman, Missouri's very own and only president. And here we have the Missouri State Animal, which is the Missouri Mule. And this is actually at the State Fair. So this is all kinds of Missouri goodness all in one photo. Uh, like I said, we have over 700,000 photographs in the archives, including one Harry Truman. So shifting to people that you probably haven't heard of, but I think you should. So first up, we have Annie White Baxter. Annie White Baxter was the first woman to be elected to any public office in Missouri, and she was the first female county clerk in the nation. She was elected in 1890 in Jasper County, and so she was elected at age 26 to oversee elections 30 years before she even had the right to vote. She was also recently inducted into the Missouri Hall of Fame, and she's pretty cool. Other people include Waffle Moore. Uh, he was the first African-American representative elected to Missouri in 1920. Remember, Missouri became a state in 1821, so it was, wasn't until 100 years later that the first African-American was elected to the state legislature. He was from St. Louis. Um, he was the only African-American for a few years in the legislature. And at that time, he was not allowed to live with the other legislators, and he was not allowed to eat with them, so he had to live and um, eat at a separate portion because Jefferson City was segregated at that time, so something to keep in mind. And finally, we have an enlistment contract for Ernest Hemingway. Uh, we have lots of military records at the State Archives, including National Guard enlistment contracts. Ernest Hemingway is an author, and he was living in Kansas City, working at the Kansas City Star as a newspaper man, according to his enlistment contract. Um, and this is right before he enlisted in World War I, where he actually um, used his experience in World War I in Italy to for a lot of his work. So he was living in Missouri and we have his enlistment contract, which is pretty cool. And thank you for virtually visiting the Missouri State Archives. We hope to see you in person soon. Feel free to check out our website. Uh, we are at sos.mo.gov slash archives, or you can shoot us an email with any of your research questions at archives at sos.mo.gov.